Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining our Japan 2020 live stream. I'm Will Dupree. Hi, I'm Aaron Cargile here from、uh, KXAN, the NBC station in Austin, Texas.、Uh, welcome from wherever you're joining us from this morning. We are so glad to have you with us. Also, I was going to say, I don't think we've told people this, that we've been doing this month after month, but、uh, leave a message in the comments. Tell us where you're watching from.、Uh, give us a, a little tidbit about you. What's your favorite, favorite Olympic sport? You know, what are you looking forward to the most? Or your favorite Olympic athlete? You know, if you're looking for a certain person to compete, that'd be wonderful to hear about, too. That's a great idea. So I'm glad that we're going to do that. And we'll try to touch back on that at the end of the stream. So keep those comments coming and we will get to them, I promise. We're starting out here again in Austin, but we want to jump right into our headlines because over in Tokyo right now, the Olympic flame is now on display. Yeah, that's right.、Uh, it, is, it has not gone out just because the Olympics didn't start、uh, when we were all expecting it to start originally.、Uh, as Will said, it's on display in Tokyo, just a short walk from the new national stadium where it was supposed to be burning a month ago. This flame arrived in Japan from Greece in March and has been largely hidden away in Tokyo since the Olympics were postponed until next year. Of course, we all know because of the COVID 19 pandemic. And that flame was unveiled Monday at a small ceremony with Japanese Olympic officials. Yeah, you can see it right here. The flame can now be seen again at that new Japan Olympic Museum for at least the next two months. Visitors can only enter the museum with a reservation. So, as we've seen, COVID 19 lead to different changes about how to enjoy kind of public spaces. This is a yet another example right there in Tokyo. We do have a statement from the president of the Japanese Olympic Committee. He said about that flame being presented there in Tokyo, he said, quote, In this situation during COVID 19, I think athletes aiming for the Olympic and Paralympic Games are training hard each day. With great anxiety. I'm convinced that the torch displayed today will support the hearts of those athletes moving forward. Yeah, I know this, is, this may sound a little bit cheesy, but I was just thinking about how, you know, the, the athletes, once they found out that, that the Olympics were going to be postponed for them, they're going to have to continue their training if they so chose to, to move forward.、Uh, the Olympic flame still burns, and, and that desire, that passion in these athletes is still burning, you know, as, as they now、uh, change that date of, of the goal of, of, you know, the Summer Olympics 2021 and now at this point. But, it's,、uh, it's symbolic, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Keep the fire burning no matter what, what really comes our Way, as we're going to get into、uh, this morning. Yeah, the flames unveiling comes just days after Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced his plans to resign because of health concerns. This is all happening as the fate of the Tokyo Olympics remains pretty uncertain even up to this point. Yeah, organizers and the International Olympic Committee say the games are still set to open on July 23rd, 2021. However, we're all waiting to hear what that's going to look like, what those plans are going to be, but they haven't released any details as of yet about how 15,400 Olympic and Paralympic athletes will be safe in Tokyo.、Uh, we've talked about various scenarios as we've come on here every single month, talking to health experts, which we're going to do again. Today, to say how realistic is this as this pandemic and the situation changes really on a day, daily basis,、um, definitely weekly basis, and as we look to other sports and events to see how those are going or not going forward、uh, at this point. So, we've talked about various scenarios of, of fans, of no fans,、um, postponing again, canceling altogether, and just putting the focus on the next Olympic Games. So, everything up in the air right now. I also want to mention、uh, we have been trying to reach out to the U.S. Olympic Committee. The USOPC to say, can somebody come on our show? Tell us what's going on behind the scenes right now.、Uh, what are those discussions? What are the different things that you're talking about? And、uh, other than what's coming out in the news and just official press releases from them, they have said it's just too early.、Uh, we're not ready you know, to, to come on a show and talk about because there's too many unknowns, too many uncertainties right now. So just want you to know that, that we are trying and trying to get answers and trying to get somebody、uh, with these、uh, very important committees right now、uh, on our show. And so we'll Keep, keep tabs on what they do say when they say it and, and let you know. But、uh, as of right now, still a lot of question marks,、um, even though the games are still set to start、uh, July 23rd of next year. Yeah, that invitation stands at any point for them to come and join us. So、yeah. we have been seeing other professional sports here in the U.S. reconvening, holding games again. And that is also happening in Japan. If you want to take a look right here, this is a tweet from the Continental Tour Gold. Showing the first event to happen 
in the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo since the COVID-19 pandemic caused the postponement of the 2020 Games. Yeah, it's good to see that the stadium isn't just sitting there empty, yeah. you know, waiting. <laughs> it is uh, getting some use out of yeah, it. Yeah, not waiting for next year to happen, but you're seeing uh, Japanese track and field athletes competing at the Seiko Golden Grand Prix. That was held uh, just a few days ago on August 23rd. Yeah, you can see them running one of the races in this tweet again from Continental Tour Gold. This event was held without fans in light of the pandemic. Yeah, like many of the uh, or all of the uh, big time sporting events even here in the United States right now going forward without fans, NBA, uh, baseball, uh, just trying to trying to get used to this whole new world uh, yeah. as we still try to have some kind of camaraderie around sports uh, at this point. Yeah, because it's a big draw and we kind of need some lightness in this moment right now because of the pandemic. It's still ongoing. While we've also seen, you know, events being held with virtual fans in the stands, we've also seen some athletes test positive, unfortunately, mm -hmm. for the coronavirus. Yeah, we want to keep you posted on what is happening in the uh, in the athlete world, how they are impacted, uh, not just with, uh, you know, having to change practice locations or change what that looks like, but some of them also, um, their health uh, has taken a hit because of this, and, and they're, they're vulnerable just like the rest of us. So uh, while some Olympic hopefuls are, are training despite the pandemic, uh, some of them um, have been sidelined uh, because of the virus. Jamaican legendary sprinter Usain Bolt. I know uh, that's a name familiar to many of us, even if you don't follow uh, track and field. He tested positive uh, for the novel coronavirus. The Jamaican health, health minister says Bolt's recent uh, contacts are being traced. And uh, just before this show, I jumped on his Twitter to see if he said anything uh, new today about about uh, his, uh, his diagnosis. So just a, a video that was posted just a few days ago where he was laying in bed, but actually uh, he has the virus, but uh, as we, as far as we know, it hasn't shown any symptoms of the virus, has been asymptomatic. So uh, he said he's trying to be responsible, will stay indoors and self-quarantine. He said he has no symptoms though. Yeah, the world record holder, as you know, in the 100 and 200 meter races, retired back in 2017. However, he's made such a giant name for himself in the Olympic world, and of course, we know him all. Yeah, for sure. Also, uh, not just folks getting diagnosed or athletes uh, that we know getting diagnosed with it, but some people around other athletes. You know, you're, sometimes you don't train alone, not just solo. You're training with other people, and you've got to, um, you know, stay away from folks, obviously, who are either showing symptoms or uh, diagnosed, uh, just like all of us out in the out in the regular world who aren't uh, big-time Olympic athletes, but a potential kin uh, contender for an Olympic medal began to train solo this summer after two of us college teammates contracted COVID-19. We're talking about Zach Harding. Uh, so he was still able to keep his time up in the pool while swimming alone near his home in Huntsville, Alabama. He did say that he had to change up his routine and be extra careful because his father has a kidney condition that makes him a high risk if he contracted COVID-19. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we, there was an interview with him. We couldn't get it to work for our broadcast this morning, but he basically said, um, you know, Yes, I'm trying to be safe and, and stay away from everyone, but I also miss having my training partners with me mm. uh, because they push each other. They push each other to, to be competitive in the pool, and I'm sure it's it's really hard to stay motivated like so many uh, Olympic hopefuls know when you're just by yourself in your house trying to, to rework your training system. You've got to do a lot and get creative to stay motivated in that environment. Yeah, and he was saying that his coaches were actually sending him videos to try to keep up with the training that his other teammates were doing. Really interesting to kind of just deal with this issue and go on, move on forward and keep up the training. Yeah, a lot of FaceTime calls, I'm sure. Yeah. A lot of Zoom calls. <laughs> Some Zoom calls in there, yeah. Yeah, we had, uh, I had a, a, a track and field athlete uh, here in Austin training and he would, uh, set up his, his uh, iPhone and, and get videos of him running down the long jump pit and then save those and send them to his coach and wait for feedback. Uh, and so we're all just having to do things a little bit differently and get creative. Yeah, the reality of this moment. Mm -hmm. We do want to share where the situation stands with COVID-19 at this point. Here in the U U.S., we've reached some pretty um, unfortunate milestones here. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the current count on the number of cases here in the country is 5.9 million. However, there are some other estimates that have shown that the U.S. has already 
surpassed 6 million cases of COVID-19, and the death count now stands at more than 180,000 people, 182,622 to be specific. These are all families that have lost a loved one that may have not even gotten to see them in the hospital at certain points due to the illness. So a lot of grieving families out there for sure. Globally, if you take a look right here, the World Health Organization now puts the COVID-19 count at more than 25 million cases across the world. 847,000 people have now died from it. And of course, 216 countries, areas, or territories have reported cases at this point. Yeah, it's hard to even um, uh, have those numbers of absorb kind of in your, in your mind because uh, like many of you, if you're watching your local stations, you're seeing the numbers in your state, in your city, here in Austin, in our central Texas region. And then when you see those numbers on a, on a global level, um, it's hard to even really comprehend those yeah. numbers right now. And, and obviously we say this every month, but uh, we are here talking about an international event hundreds of countries coming together, thousands of athletes, and that is why um, there's so many uncertainties surrounding what the Olympics next year, if it goes on, will look like, and that's why we keep going back to our, our medical expert uh, for our Japan uh, 2020 so show, uh, Dr. Thomas. Will you talk to him almost every month uh, just to get a, a tab, uh, uh, an idea of where we're at right now? What is he thinking? Has anything changed? Uh, and pretty much every month he says, I just don't see how the Olympics can go on with fans at this point and he really hasn't wavered from that and so I'm always curious to see okay what is he going to say this month and especially as we see more sports uh, venture out uh, and, and really set the example of okay what's going to happen and when the NBA goes back the Major League Baseball uh, we're all looking to these other sports to set the tone and, and see what what they're having to face right now and what they're going through to say okay what does that mean for the Olympics in, in less than a year at this point yeah we started our conversation by me asking him about those really unfortunate landmarks we've hit of 6 million COVID-19 cases here in the U.S. and more than 180,000 deaths at this point. I wanted to get his thoughts about where he thinks we stand as a country. That's where our conversation gets off. Yeah, I think we're still facing a lot of different uh, challenges. One uh, is we still seem to have a testing challenge and of course, with the uh, you know the new guidance uh, uh, that came out from the CDC and the confusion that that has caused, that hasn't really helped uh, helped the situation. Um, and because testing is really you know the basis of, of of course identifying infected people and then supporting the public health in interventions that are required to uh, decrease transmission around those people. Um, I do think on the positive side. Um, you know, overall mortality seems to be uh, decreasing, meaning that people who do get infected and people that have uh, clinical illness and end up in the hospital, um, uh, more of those people are surviving and walking out of the hospital. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, is sort of a testament to our um, healthcare providers that have been, uh, you know, learning how to better care for people. There are, of course, questions about whether it's safe to hold a large gathering like a sporting event. However, we're seeing athletes return to play at both professional, collegiate, and high school levels. What are the most important factors to consider to be able to hold something like that safely and keep everyone healthy? One, I think it depends upon the sport and if it's, if it's a sport where individuals compete as individuals or if it's a sport where you're going to have uh, lots of people in close contact uh, for a prolonged uh, period of time and, and not protected through the use of, of a mask. Um, I also think it depends on whether or not there are going to be uh, uh, spectators uh, involved. Uh, that, that's another uh, element that has to be uh, considered. Obviously, uh, having hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of people coming together at this time is, uh, uh, you know, anywhere in the United States is not um, uh, is not advised at, at, at this point. Last month when you joined me, we talked about your hospital joining a COVID-19 vaccine trial. How is work going with that now? Oh, it's going quite well. So we are one of the, you know, over 100 sites that Pfizer and BioNTech um, uh, uh, developers have, uh, have chosen to, to uh, participate in their phase three trial. Uh, so it's going quite well. The you know the community, and I'm a, I'm assuming that this is across uh, the country. The outpouring of community support uh, to volunteer in the trial has been uh, has been tremendous. I mean, we've had 
well over a thousand people have contacted us um, uh, to be part of this. It's it's uh, uh, the outpouring has been so great that it's been difficult to keep up with um, you know getting back to all these uh, all these folks. So. Uh, so people raising their hand to participate has not been uh, has not been an issue. What do you think is the timeline for this? There's been discussion this week from uh, political figures about that it could be by the end of the year, maybe sooner. Is that realistic? Uh, yeah. So again, I still look at this as two different components. One component is you know completing the experiment and showing that the vaccine is safe and effective. Uh, the other component, which is just as important, if not more important. Um, is actually getting the vaccine uh, to the people and the people actually be willing to um, to be vaccinated because it's it's vaccination which is going to um, you know save people's lives and it's vaccination which is going to prevent transmission from one person uh, you know to another and so you know I I still feel the same that I felt in January of 2020 that this is uh, you know we are not going to have a large scale deployment of uh, of a vaccine and large scale uptake of the vaccine until at least uh, the second quarter of calendar year 2021. That again is Dr. Stephen Thomas from Upstate University Hospital in Syracuse, New York. He has joined us for the past few months to talk about COVID-19 and where things stand. And a couple of things that jump out from what he was saying is that we are seeing mortality increase so that people who are getting diagnosed with coronavirus are surviving. They may have gone in the hospital, but they are living through that. So that was one thing he pointed out. Additionally, he said that any kind of event with large amounts of spectators, no go. Yeah, he has not. Uh, he hasn't wavered, like I said earlier, from that since the since the very beginning. Yeah. And he told me a, a couple months ago when uh, you were out and I, I interviewed him for you, uh, he basically said, I think that the the U.S. Uh, Olympic leaders they need to start planning if they're gonna if, if they're gonna make it a call either way if it's no fans it's gonna take them from now until the Olympics to come up with a health and safety plan again mm. these are smart people these are things that they're already thinking about and no uh, but basically they need to make a decision at this point so that they can spend the next few months coming up with what that health and safety plan is going to be at the uh, at the Olympic Games because if you've if you've never been and I know it's a it's a very unique thing to get to go to um, I I was in uh, Pyeongchang, South Korea for the Winter Olympics. I am planning to go to Tokyo, you know, for the Summer Olympics next year as well. But, um, you know, obviously there's thousands of spectators there in addition to the athletes and tons of people who are just there for the infrastructure um, around everything around the Olympic zone, the Olympic Park. And so each time you go into an Olympic zone, uh, there is security that you have to go through. So um, you scan your you scan your ID if you're, you know, part of, part of a, the media covering the Olympics. If you're a spectator, you You've also got a, a special ID that, that you have to get through or tickets that you've got to get to whatever special event you have. Um, but it's just like being at the airport. So imagine that uh, temperature checks, all the, um, you know, the screenings that we're seeing now um, uh, up on a, a whole new level uh, already with that many people there. And so it's going to take it's going to take a lot of planning. Um, and then obviously they have to decide if the social distancing uh, parameters are still in place, what that's going to look like, how many fewer fans are going to be able to sit in in those stadiums, whether they're indoors or outdoors, um, it, it's a lot to think about. And so they need to make a decision either way at this point, according to Dr. Thomas, and then start working through that plan. It's going to take until now, uh, until next July. And largely the thinking is that that plan will be unveiled at some point during the fall. We are approaching that at this point. So there may be some kind of breaking news to share regarding that plan here relatively soon. Yeah, I was watching the weather this morning. It's already the first meteorology, meteor, I can't even say the word. It's Meteor Part, yeah. logical day. That's the best I can do. Um, the day of fall. I mean, mm -hmm. we're already in September. Granted, yeah. it's still 100 degrees here in Austin, Texas right now, but we are <laughs> Not getting... Not much relief here, yeah, yeah. we're getting into the fall, and it's already about to be Thanksgiving, Christmas, and before we know it, I mean, that, that Olympic Games is just going to be a, a, a few days away, so it's going to feel like... For sure. Yeah. All right. We've got a special guest with we us do. this morning. So let's bring him in. We have joining us this morning... David De Guzman from WFXR, that's the Next Star Station in Roanoke, Virginia. David, thank you so much for hanging around with us and joining us to talk. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's really an honor to be here. Olympics are my passion, so it's great to be on the show. That's yes, awesome. It's good to have you with us, and I love the, our logo that you have got behind you. You've got the, the cool setup going this morning. 
great behind the scenes people, you know, me, myself, and I, but hey, thanks for passing along the monitor graphics so I can put that into the TV screen behind me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's looking good. I know we're all, we're all just, it's just the norm now for all of us to be broadcasting uh, from home. But uh, David, fill us in on what, uh, what athlete you're going to be talking about and, and what, what subject matter you're going to tackle for us this morning. Yeah, mental health, and it's been such a big issue, especially in 2020 with the Olympics postponed to 2021. Mental health is definitely an issue that's on a lot of people's minds, especially for Olympic athletes. I recently talked with Christy Pierce Rampone. That name should sound a little familiar. She has been to four Olympics, one silver medal, three gold medals. Of course, she was also the captain of the U.S. women's soccer team in those teams that went all the way and won the World Cup in 1999 and then in 2015. So uh, she knows a thing or two about winning, but uh, she recently wrote a book with her friend, Dr. Christine Keene, uh, called Be All In. It's a, a book called Raising Kids for Success in Sports and in Life, but mental health was one of the big topics that we tackled. And we talked just as the HBO documentary, Weight of Gold, came out, which kind of uh, put this huge spotlight on mental health and how Olympic athletes deal with mental health issues, especially after an Olympics. So I took the opportunity to ask, you know, Christy Rampone, listen, you've been to multiple Olympic Games, you've been to the pinnacle winning three gold medals, uh, but we all know how an Olympics goes. It's a big ramp up and you're trying to peak for those games, then all of a sudden it's over and it's kind of like we don't really hear from you again. So what are the mental health issues that Olympic athletes deal with? Is that a real thing? So I asked Christy Rampone what that was like and here's what she had to say. It is tough, that transition from going from such a high and being successful, winning gold medals and coming home, and then that adrenaline is gone, you know, and then it's like, what's next? And luckily I was able to continue to play and prepare, you know, from a World Cup, you get to prepare for Olympics, so you get the, the two years of that high, but coming off in a Olympics, it was challenging because you're trying to figure out, you know, am I gonna go another four years? What's my next chapter look like? So definitely is mentally challenging and I did, seek out help with sports psychologists to get me through those low periods of, you know, how to enjoy the victory, but yet figure out what's next. Yeah, again, that was that sound bite there from Christy Rampone. Uh, what was interesting is that she's talking about, you know, they're coming off such a high achievement and being celebrated all across the country and the world. And then they're also facing this question about what comes next. It seems like a difficult thing, but maybe understandable as well. I mean, it's just fascinating that even she admitted that she sought help from a sports psychologist. And it's something that, you know, I asked Dr. Keene about, you know, we saw in the documentary with the uh, HBO's Weight of Gold that a lot of the athletes that were profiled were kind of individual athletes in terms of, you know, they compete in individual sports. But obviously, Christy uh, Pierce Rampone competes on a team and I asked her, does it make a difference? that you're on a team as opposed to competing in individual sports like swimming or track and field. And Dr. Keene actually brought up a good point is that even if you have that support group of your teammates or your close friends, you really need someone who is a professional to deal with the issues of mental health that your friends or your support group or your, you know, your teammates might not be prepared for. So I thought it was very interesting that she admitted to seeking help. I thought that is great to the conversation overall that we should all be having about mental health. I mean, I deal with mental health as well. I have anxiety. And so we're just trying to, you know, really uncover the conversation and what this is really about. And it's also another good point. I mean, for athletes, they spend all their lives for this huge event to compete at their best. And then after that, what's next? I mean, Aaron, I know you were in Pyeongchang. I've been to three Olympics myself, but after the Olympics, we just kind of go back to our jobs. Like for me, high school football was after going to uh, the Rio 2016 Olympics. But for these athletes, it, it's kind of like, okay, what do I do now? And, and you really need to seek out that help when you need it. Yeah, David, we're definitely, as, as media and reporters, on a high just to get to go to the Olympics. But we get to come back to this job that we know and this life that we know. And uh, you were talking a lot about the way to gold. 
and they uh, talk about how they've many of them from childhood have devoted their entire life to this goal of making it to the Olympics and then they get home and they say who am I as a human being and as a person I love the question that you asked her about is it different if you're part of a team versus an individual athlete because I feel like a lot of the athletes we heard from in the HBO documentary weight of gold is they were uh, they were uh, not team athletes but individual athletes and the thing about that I, struck me and, and came to mind when t thinking about a team is you heard athletes in the documentary talk about the fact that you know we're on the outside supposed to look like we're made of steel and don't have a weakness and aren't vulnerable so many times uh, they don't even want to show that side to teammates uh, they want to look like they, they've got all their all their their life together um, and, and don't have a weakness in that aspect so that could be something else that that could prevent somebody from opening up to another teammate uh, or whatnot and I also think it was uh, interesting in in the documentary again how um, when some of them did ask for help their medical trainers or said hey I think something's you know I'm just not feeling quite right um, they didn't get that help uh, they didn't take the extra steps to actually bring in somebody like a sports psychologist everybody was more there for the physical aspect of get, getting them ready for that competition physically um, not necessarily paying a lot of attention to the mental side even when they asked for help or said I don't think I'm feeling quite right um, when it comes to my mental health so uh, David also before we go uh, you talked about me getting to go to the Olympics but you've been to some Olympics too tell us uh, tell us about your experience and and what you got to do uh, at different points in your career yeah, I th we were talking right before the show that, you know, I think I was next door to where all the NBC affiliates were, where all the local reporters were working. Uh, it, it was an incredible experience. I mean, the Olympics is just an amazing, I mean, there's no words to describe what it's like to be in that Olympic sphere. Uh, I've been to three. I was an intern in London. I got to go as a production associate in Sochi and in Rio. Uh, it, it was just this weird little like city of like all these journalists going to all these different places and it, it's amazing how a lot of us we talk about going to you know swimming and track and field and gymnastics but then you have people from different countries who are like oh I got to go to this huge judo event or I got to go to wrestling but that's like the beauty and the magic of working in Olympics you have all these different countries and different interests and they're all colliding I, I tell people and people ask me why do you love the Olympics so much it's because for 17 days we try our best to see what the world could be like if we all got along and there were, you know, very little problems. So it's kind of like what the world could be if we removed all, you know, the, the, the craziness that's going on in the world. It's not perfect, but it's, it's amazing. So just being there, it's, it's a high that you get only every two years and then it's over and then you're just thinking, okay, when's the next Olympics? So uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Plus, you get to meet so many different people that, you know, you don't normally get to see. And uh, I, I have to say, Aaron, I was lucky when I went to Sochi, it was considered one of the warmest games. I know Pyeongchang wasn't like that for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was super cold, and that's what I'm looking forward to with Tokyo. I know last summer, about the same time that the Olympics were supposed to hit this year, uh, they were talking about the heat wave and how hot yeah. it was. Of course, I'm as a Texan thinking, that. bring it on. I'm used to this. <laughs> but uh, it was they were, they were really hot last summer, and so I was looking forward to being able to wear a short sleeve and, and, and shorts running around with a bunch of uh, equipment for sure. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot. But, yeah, you're right. No one's really in a bad mood. At the Olympic Games, everyone is, uh, is just excited to be there. And so we, are, we have been excited to have you with us this morning, David. Uh, thank you so much for joining us from our uh, sister station in Roanoke, Virginia. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again, David. Really awesome to have him join our conversation today. I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and to have the mental health conversation continue, uh, you know, for for a while here. And hopefully it continues to be part of the uh, just everyday conversation as these athletes uh, start to open up and um, and be honest about the fact that this is something they've dealt with for years and years and it's yeah. not going away and uh, one of the uh, seven teammates on our next star nation team uh, got to interview uh, a boxer I'm sorry a weightlifter uh, Katie Nye uh, he has been talking to her I know he's been doing stories multiple stories on her uh, not just about her incredible incredible athletic ability but also she is very open about her diagnosis of bi uh, bipolar disorder uh, he has been talking to 
to her about how she's addressed that over the years uh, as an Olympic athlete. And uh, I was just reading the story that Jack has uh, on his Wood TV website out mm -hmm. of uh, out of Michigan, and it was actually her husband who said, "I think that maybe you should think about getting some help yeah. uh, and talking to somebody." And so, uh, thank goodness for people in our lives who say the right thing at the right time uh, and and say, hey, I think, you know, I don't know that I can help you and give you the help that you need. So maybe it would be a good idea to, you know, talk to a talk to a professional at this point. And so she was able to do that. And um, as Jack mentions in the stories that he's done about her, she's very open about it on her social media, on her Instagram, not just talks about her Olympic journey and um, and what she's doing training wise, but also what she's doing to keep her mind uh, healthy yeah. through these times. Um, in Jack's story, as well I was listening to that to be able to pull the video to show you all at home and one of the lines in it is that it takes a certain amount of strength not only to compete in this way but also to come forward and say this is what I'm dealing with maybe it will help you as, as well. Yeah, and as we put, uh, many of us put these athletes, uh, I know I do, I, I put I them on this pedestal <laughs> and say, man, these are incredible people. And when they start being honest about these things, uh, then it brings more normalcy. And, and not just talking about you know athletes, but anyone even out of the athletic realm um, who, no matter what they do, whether it's a celebrity uh, or, or you know somebody famous in any aspect, um, starting to talk about these things and, and letting the rest of us, uh, the rest of us know that it's okay and these are real things that all of us deal with. Um, on a daily basis. So uh, great, great coverage by Jack there and uh, also David for keeping that mental health conversation going. For sure. We also want to highlight another story that one of our Next Star Nation team members did here re recently about an Olympic athlete. Yeah, we have uh, been doing this series called Journey to Tokyo. Uh, no matter where you, where you live, wherever you're watching our feed right now, your station has been airing these stories every week, uh, leading up to when the original uh, Tokyo 2020 Olympics were gonna were gonna um, happen. And now we're continuing to do these stories each week because we want to keep you up to speed on on what's going on in these athletes' uh, athletes' lives. And no matter if it's the pandemic or what they're doing for training to get creative. So these segments, if you haven't seen them, are called Journey to Tokyo. And uh, the one this week uh, that we're going to bring you here is about a Virginia swimmer. Uh, it's put him on the other side of the world uh, for the foreseeable future. One of our teammates on our Next Star Nation team, Maria Elena Belores, has the story about him. Ian Ho had a goal to compete for Hong Kong on the world stage. Which has been amazing to be able to compete at such a high level. The swimmer traveled to Hong Kong in the early spring. He was gearing up for one of his final meets before the Olympics as the coronavirus spread across the United States. So I was in the stage of training where I was ready to I was ready to compete. Ho expected to be back in the United States by the end of April, but as with so many things this year, the coronavirus changed those plans. So he's making the most of his time with his extended family. Everyone except for my immediate family is here in Hong Kong, so it's been nice being able to spend some time with them. His hometown of Blacksburg, Virginia, is also where he honed his skills as a top-notch swimmer at Virginia Tech. He came in, he was a walk on at Virginia Tech, and he became the record holder. And then he was, last year he was one tenth of a second of the Olympic cut. That's a very difficult cut. That was the top 16 time of the last Olympics. His 2020 Olympic dreams are now on hold, but he is staying focused on 2021, training any way he can. Now that now that my qualifiers are done, I'm trying to go to the beach some more, swim some there, which has been nice. Trying to do dry land by myself here in, in the apartment. Making the most of unexpected circumstances as his eyes remain on the Tokyo Olympics. If Tokyo 2021 happens, I am I'm trying to go for it right now. On the journey to Tokyo, I'm Maria Elena Baloris. All right, second, a Virginian. Virginian? Do they call themselves Virginians? I'm not really sure. I believe so. <laughs> but um, Maria Elena is a reporter with Wavy, uh, our, uh, our sister station, our next star station in Norfolk. Virginia. So a great story and a reminder again how people are just rolling with the punches right now. And amazing to hear him say that he's doing his own training at his apartment. So so much of our life is at home at this moment. So it is for an athlete as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's weird for me to actually like put makeup on and, and, and get semi-dressed up to come here with Will because every other day of the week I'm working from home uh, right now. Not as hard as these Olympic athletes, I'm sure, though. Yeah. We also want to show there's another athlete that is doing her own training, too. And both Aaron and I love gymnastics. So we had to end this way and show you all this particular moment from Simone Biles, the greatest gymnast 
in the world, I would say. You right. know, that might be a little subjective to put out there, but I think it's true. So she tweeted out just last week about her training once again in the gym. So we wanted to play this video for her uh, in the gym here in Texas. I mean, just makes it so look yeah. so easy. I'm just holding up. There we go. Yeah, and I'm going to I want to go back to the end of this because I want to point out something really quickly. Okay. So down here at the end, if you notice right here, that coach has a mask on yep. as well as this woman who is standing by the beam back here. So, yes, the athletes are out there practicing, but they are still trying to be as safe as possible and wear their masks. Yeah, it is good to see that for sure. And you said this is her training in here in Texas. Is yes. this in, in Houston? Or? I believe it says the World Championship Center back there. I'm not exactly sure where that is here in Texas, but you see the big Texas flag on the wall. Yeah. I mean, incredible. I mean, we could just watch that over and over. <laughs> also, I'm gonna I'm give, look, giving a little plug here for Will. Uh, so when he was was this your previous station? It was. He so Will was a gymnast and an incredible gymnast. And if you go to his uh, Instagram, is it on any other social media platforms right um, now? It's just on Instagram. Okay, moment, on yeah. Instagram, which you just just your name, Will Dupree, D U P R E E. That's right. Um, you can see a, a story that he put together when he was at his previous station doing some gymnastics moves, and I mean, incredible as a as a men's gymnast, he had a, it was your dream to go to the Olympics. Yeah, as a kid, my dream was to either be a mouseketeer or um, an Olympian. So those are the two goals in life. Neither one really worked out and in that way, are. but here I am right now talking to you on television. Yeah, it's pretty incredible because <laughs> the video is you doing some gymnastics moves not too long ago. Yeah, just four years ago. So before that story, we were talking about the Olympics and kind of doing some associated coverage and stories and as a kid growing up, we would always see when the Olympics would hit, business would go up at gyms because yeah. all the kids were watching at home, they were inspired, they wanted to get involved, and we would see a business boom for the gyms. That's what the story was about, and I thought, why not throw in some tumbling to surprise people a little bit. I mean, it looked like you were still back there as a, as a teenager <laughs> in gymnastics. I You're... will say that it will take a lot more uh, stretching to yeah. be able to do it again, but it was so much fun. I went to a gym at, in our Central Texas area a couple of years ago because one of my old coaches was still a coach, and I was there to give the girls a pep talk. They were about to go to their first team competition. And so, of course, I got there and, and did some some flips that we can still do because our muscle memory is so impressive. Right, it's still there. Yeah, I couldn't walk for two weeks after that. <laughs> I, I really put on a show for them and then I would get you know getting into your mid-30s you really can't do that your body cannot do the same thing it's not it the same <laughs> it's not the same at all Yeah, but definitely check that video out it's very very impressive no I mean not as good as Simone Biles let's I mean let's just be no, honest she sets the gold standard so we yeah. can't even touch that no yeah <laughs> well, we want to thank you all for watching our stream this is kind of wrapping up our coverage today yeah we really appreciate it wherever you're watching from I've seen some of you comment uh, that you're watching us from 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 Texas I think there's a uh, someone out there from New Mexico Mexico also tuning in so we really appreciate it again we do this the first Tuesday of every month and we'll do so up until the Japan 2020 games and uh, roll with the punches and be here for all the ups and downs as many decisions still have to be made about what's going to happen and what the Olympics will look like if they go on uh, in July of next year so we really appreciate you being with us and spending your Tuesday morning with us yeah we appreciate it Everyone, thanks again for watching. I'm Will Dupree. I'm Erin Cargyle. Have a great rest of your week.